Good morning. This morning's scripture is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amminadab, Amminadab the father of Nation, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was father to Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zodak, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus who is called the Messiah. Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. You know Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, Comet and Cupid and Donner and Blitzen, but do you recall the most famous reindeer of all? You don't think I'm going to do the names like he did, do you? Our liturgist last night just bailed out and made Pastor Sherry read it. <laughs> Why do we read these names? Why are they even in the Bible? What, what is this about when we have this? This one was the son of, and this one was, the, and this one. And we kind of skipped this over. The first time I read this in the Bible, I'm like, what? But they tell us a story. They tell us who we are, where we come from, and why it matters. Jesus is who we're talking about. For the next few months, we're going to go through and and try to discern his life. And while he's not yet born, because we haven't come to Christmas Day, by looking at his lineage, we learn a lot of things about Jesus. By looking at our own lineage, we learn a lot of things. I don't know how many of you have done that Ancestry.com I haven't done it. You know, there's things I just don't want out on the internet for whatever it's worth. But I've been told things about my lineage, stories that I was told for years and years about how we were royalty that ruled a valley in Alsace-Lorraine between Germany and France. And for some odd reason I never understood, one of my ancestors moved from Buffalo, New York. Now, why would anybody ever do that? When my mother passed away, I read a letter, and I found out why. You see, my great-great-great-great-grandfather was 56 years old when his wife died. So he went out into town, and he married the 24-year-old barmaid. And so the good people of Europe said, this doesn't do. Nobility doesn't do that here. You could do that over in that trashy place called America, but you can't do that over here in Europe. 
get out of town. And so my great, 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 great grandfather and his new wife came to Buffalo, New York. And that tells me some things about myself. Who was Jesus? Well, in this genealogy, we have all sorts of people he's related to. Abraham, who was the founder of a faith that billions of people have followed. It says in verse 22 that that this fulfilled prophecy, his birth. He was also son of King David. Other kings are mentioned in here. But David was the one that was promised to have an heir that would rule on the throne forever. Destined to be a king. Destined to be a priest and the father of all faiths, Jesus. But in Luke, we turn there and we see a few more names. The son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalalalala, the son of Kenan, who started the center up in Lockport, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of man, the son of of God. See, genealogies tell us something. So when we trace everything back, we find out that Jesus is the Son of God in some ways as Adam was the Son of God, but in some ways more so because Jesus was destined for this from the very beginning of time. He was the Son of God as Adam was born into this world in the beginning of creation. He's the Son of God before creation. In the Gospel of John, it says, In beginning, beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were created through him. Jesus was, was on a mission from God. There was a plan of God, and we find that plan in many ways in this genealogy, that he's to be the Savior. You know, sometimes in my life, I feel like the great, 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 great grandson of the barmaid. Somebody nobody wanted. Somebody pushed aside. Somebody who just wants to be considered okay by folks in the world. I know who I am. I know where I come from. I know what I've been. I know what I've done wrong. I know what I've done right. And sometimes I feel I don't measure up. But Jesus came on a mission from God to bring God into our world. Emmanuel, God with us. We call it the atonement, to make ourselves at one with God by the grace of God himself. His birth brings us to God. That's what Christmas is all about. God being born, not not in a little stable many, many years ago, but in our hearts today, in our lives. Why do we follow a God from 2,000 years ago? We don't. That's religion. We follow a living, breathing God that interacts with us, Jesus born to us. His name itself means God saves. It's the same name as Joshua. From the beginning, God saves us, saves us from the fact that we can't keep the rules, saves us from the fact that we can't be perfect, saves us from the fact that the world sometimes doesn't accept us and looks at us and says, you're not good enough. Sometimes I feel like the great, 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 great grandson of the barmaid who somehow in some ways was not good enough. And that's why I turned to Jesus, the Messiah. They were looking for somebody to save them from the Romans. We're all looking for someone to save us sometimes from our, from our, our physical problems, whether we don't have enough money or, or, or we're struggling with our family affairs or we have problems in our relationships or we have difficulties at work or maybe other things more political. But Jesus is here to save us from something more important, to save us from the brokenness in ourselves. It's interesting that Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 says to us, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Which doesn't mean God doesn't love people that do the right things. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to give us to give our gifts to God. He's saying, if you think that it's about the religion, then you're missing the whole point. It's about mercy. It's about being 
change because so many of us feel broken. All of the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. They never let poor Rudolph join in any reindeer games. I don't know what reindeer games are. I really never quite understood that part of the song. But I know what it's like to be excluded. Anybody here ever been left out? You don't need to raise your hand. Left out, last person called on the playground, or even worse, the one that they say, I'm sorry, we don't need you. You can go home because you didn't measure up to the other ones. Rudolph had a red nose. That was his problem. Each of us sometimes feel that there's something about us that causes us to feel excluded, to feel like we're not part of the world everybody else has, we feel broken. And the genealogy of Jesus says that he is a savior, not for just the good people, not for just the people who seem to do everything right, but for the broken people as well. This genealogy is is fascinating with the people that are included. We've got a con man, we've got a killer, We've, we've got a mercenary, we've got an adulterer, they mention some women, and each one of the women mentions, makes an important point about some episode in the faith life of Israel. The woman Tamar, who had a child with her father-in-law. Or, or the young prostitute, who saved the, the people from being caught when they were spying for Israel. And then there was Ruth, who was a foreign woman. She wasn't even an Israelite. Neither was Rahab. They were people from foreign countries that somehow made an important contribution to the life of Israel. But they were never really accepted. You can read it in the Bible and read through the lines how they look at them. And they don't look at them very well. And then we have Bathsheba, who's not even mentioned. Just that she was Uriah's wife. And if you read the story of David, you're really going to get a story about how a king really, really, really messed up. But they're all included. They're all included because the incarnation of God is open to everyone, no matter what our flaws, no matter what our brokenness, no matter who we are, whether we fit right or we don't fit right, whether we belong to this culture or we don't. We have the same situation in our own lives. I don't know about you, but I've got all kinds of strange people in my history. The hot-headed Scotchman. I've got the guy who belonged to the mob. I've got a governor. I've also got an illegal alien. I've got people that would probably not be accepted in this church, and then others who would be given a seat of honor. By the way, Some of you are feeling a little displaced because people started moving around. Sorry about that. I noticed that. Several people are in a different place today. That's kind of interesting. You're looking at this. Maybe you got your seat. Consider yourself lucky because everybody's moving today for some reason. God, you see, when he becomes with us, Emmanuel, he's no longer God out there. He's no longer a God we talk about. He's no longer a God of religion. He's a God with us. And he invites everyone, no matter who they are, to be a part of his community of faith. This church has a lot of diversity in many different ways. Maybe not as much as our world around us, our community doesn't. But we have people from high and low positions in our culture. We have people of different backgrounds, different races, people born here, people born somewhere else. And that's a good thing. It's a blessing. Because the more we have that, the more we reflect God, just like Jesus reflected that in his genealogy. And this was shared purposefully. It's hard sometimes because we want to keep our children and our lives from from being assaulted by somebody who does something wrong, and yet we all know we all do wrong, amen? So who do we protect them from? In the book of Acts, Jesus said, or God said, don't call anything unclean that I have made clean. 
See, the goal is not to remain sinners. The goal is not to remain broken. The goal is to be redeemed so that we can live a righteous life like Jesus' stepfather, Joseph, did. Joseph was a righteous man, and I can understand that. And sometimes I feel like the great, 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 great grandson of royalty. Sometimes I do the right thing. You know, I, I often, for an example, will share with you some of the things I do wrong. I don't tell you all the worst of stuff, but I, I have to tell you, I don't feel like I live the worst of lives. I don't believe there's some kind of great scandal out there waiting to assault me. I don't feel I've done something so horrible that you'd be embarrassed to call me your pastor. I usually do the right thing, and when I do the wrong thing, it's usually because, well, I'm not always the smartest person in the situation. Anybody else ever have that? You say something, you do something, and somebody points it out, and you go, <laughs> what was I thinking? But sometimes I feel like, you know, I, I come from nobility. I'm really not that bad a guy. I grew up in the church. I have an understanding of the rules. I try to keep them. And it's important to do the right thing. I'm not arguing to go out and do whatever you want and break the laws of God just because he'll forgive you. Joseph was a righteous man. He cared what people thought. He was descended from kings. I suspect he had a little sign he put out in front of the houses he built, built by Joe, you know? He was proud of his work. And he, he studied the scriptures. He, he, he was a person who we see went to Jerusalem, which was a, a hard journey, because he felt it was important at least once a year to worship in the temple of God. He worshiped weekly. He knew his scriptures. He knew what was right. He knew what was wrong. And he had a simple dream, a dream that most of us can identify. He just wanted to have a, a, a halfway decent career and have a good family. And so he, he had picked out for his, his, his bride a young girl named Mary, who he probably had known all of his life. I mean, Mary was, was, a, was a good girl. She really was. I mean, read the story about Mary. She was a good girl. Somebody he could be proud of as a man who did the right thing. She was kind of the person who did the right thing as well. She came from good family, which can be very important. Then she went away to visit her relative Elizabeth, right? He was fine with that. That's okay. Go visit Elizabeth. And when she came back, she had put on some weight. And he thought, well, good. You know, she learned how to cook from Elizabeth. Not a bad thing, right? Until she said, I'm having a baby. And you can imagine how his dreams just fell like broken glass, right? Shattered. What does this mean? What am I supposed to do with this? And she says, it's okay, Joe. It's God's child. <laughs> now, Joe was a religious fella. He, he, he loved God, but, you know, really. And even if he believed her, what, what do you do with this? Fortunately, Joseph had a dream in which God gave him the truth, and he listened to that, but he could have looked back at his own genealogy. After all, Tamar was, was, was a young woman who had lost both of her husbands. The rule back in that day was that if, if, if a woman died, with, or a man died, rather, without having a child, his wife would become the wife of his brother. I want you to think about that, guys. Changes a few things, doesn't it? And, it, and, if, and it, if that one died, which is what happened, she became the wife of the next son. Judah, Judah only had three sons. So Judah, Judah wouldn't let her marry the third son. He thought she was a black widow. He wasn't going to take a chance on his last child. So you can read the story because at this point, if I go too much farther, it'll go beyond PG, and I, I've got to be careful with this sermon, right? But, but read the story, and you'll find out that Tamar, with a disguise, ended up having a child with her father-in-law who, when he found out she was pregnant, was going to have her disgraced, cast out. At least Joseph wanted to do it quietly and put her away, you know, without so much noise and fanfare. But if he had looked back, he would have realized that Judah was about to cast out his own grandchild, his own child, 
the heir to his world because he didn't understand what God was doing. See, we can pursue righteousness, and that's a good thing, but sometimes the pursuit of righteousness can get in the way of grace, and we can find ourselves in such a world that, that, that we feel we have to be so full of judgment that we cast away what really is God's plan in our lives. Joseph was about to cast out and cast away his own Savior. Think about that. Because that's actually what the nation of Israel did. They cast away their own Savior rather than embracing him. And we don't want to do that. Even if we're feeling like we're doing a pretty good life and, and we're doing okay about keeping these commands of God and we're trying to do the right thing, we're never in a place where we want to push away grace because we need grace all of us do, no matter how good you might be. Amen? Sometimes, you see, we face difficult decisions. You're all going to face them in life. Where it feels like there's not a good thing to do. There is a thing to do, but we can't figure it out. He's either going to hurt Mary and cast away Jesus, or he's going to be unfaithful to his religion and the rules and the laws that he's always known and, and risk losing the reputation that he worked so hard to build. It's a conundrum. This happens on every Hallmark Channel movie. <laughs> Have you ever noticed this? I watched one with my wife last night, and sure enough, they, they go through the movie, and usually some new fella appears in the movie and falls in love with this girl and there's often a dweeb boyfriend that's sort of cast aside and we're all going, yeah, and rooting for this couple to get together. But it, 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 just about 20 minutes before the movie ends, they always run into some misunderstanding. Something where it looks like the, the fellow or the woman has done something terribly wrong and so hurtful that they will never be able to be together. And we all go, oh, and it's always about 20 minutes before the movie ends. <laughs> and then they, they wrestle around and they wrestle around until they come to the last three minutes. <laughs> it's just the truth. And in the last three minutes, they, the, the person who feels hurt finds out Oh, they were just doing something wonderful. It wasn't a bad thing. It was a good thing. And they just didn't understand how it worked. And then in the last minute, they kiss and snow falls. <laughs> now you know every Hallmark movie that is ever on TV. Am I right? Say amen. amen. You know it's going to happen. You watch it. And you watch it anyways. We all do. It's really just a remake of the story of Joseph and Mary, isn't it? Isn't it fascinating? It's a remake of the story of Joseph and Mary. We can make the wrong decision for good reasons. We need to make sure that we always turn to grace. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it says to us, He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. That's all of us. Not the letter but the Spirit, for the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. It's not, it's not keeping the law in some exactitude so as to be able to say, I've, I've done things right, but to do what the Spirit would teach us in our hearts and what we would understand is the purpose behind this, which is to bring us to grace. Joe was faithful to his religion. He doesn't want to be seen as doing anything wrong. What would his family think? What would his neighbors think? What what, what would everybody around him think? They need a paradigm shift. You know what a paradigm shift is? It's when what we thought was happening changes to something different. Poor Rudolph is being rejected by all the reindeer because he, he's got a red shiny nose. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then, all the reindeer loved him. A paradigm shift as all of a sudden, the other reindeer 
they saw that Rudolph wasn't some kind of weird reject. He was actually the hero savior. Just like Matthew saw that, or Joseph saw rather, excuse me, it's in Matthew. Joseph saw that Jesus wasn't a mistake. He was the plan from the very beginning. It's hard to receive grace and it's hard to extend grace. True love is not an easy thing. But what we need to understand is that true love is, is about something so powerful that it's beyond what we normally think of. In, in the Bible it says that when a couple become married, a man will leave his family and a woman leave her home and the two will become one. See, I'm not the great, 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 great grandson of nobility and the great, great grandson of a barmaid. I'm the great, great grandson of people that found a way to get beyond their worlds and find love. That's an amazing story that this man would give up his family lineage, and this woman would give up her home to come and make a life in Buffalo and be people that created, in some distance way, me. And I know some of you are wondering, you know, why would a 24-year-old bar marry, marry a, a rich 56-year-old bachelor nobleman? But I need to let you know that they were married for 40 years. She passed away at 64, and he lived two more years to 98. Fascinating, isn't it? Born in 1776. You see, the truth is these people change who we are when we start to recognize where we come from. And I know that I'm a product of both of those. That's why some of you come from a working class background and you know I can talk your language. You know what I'm talking about? Because I come from that world. You know what I mean? That's just the truth. If you don't like it, too bad for you. But some of you know that I also come from a middle class background and so I can speak the proper way and I know which fork to use and when to use it. You see, don't be afraid is what the angel said. Don't be afraid to worry about what other people say. Don't be afraid of what someone might think. Don't be afraid of anything but God. Because the only failure you'll ever have in life is if you fail to receive the grace of God. Fear. Fear is a great motivator, and we need to get beyond it. First John tells us that perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is made perfect in love. And you too can be perfect in love. We cast out our fears. And we embrace a God that wants to embrace us. Emmanuel. Become one with us. His plan from the beginning. God is with us. Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel. And ransom blessed Israel. You know, we do worry about what people say, what people think. We don't like to be excluded from reindeer games or any other kind of games. But the truth of the matter is, the Lord of the universe, the God who created everything, the one who is and was and will be, thinks you're wonderful, has decided that in spite of your brokenness and your struggles and your problems, even if you're a barmaid, that God wants to be with you and live with you and dwell with you. So take that into this world with confidence and don't be afraid because God is with you. Go in his peace. Amen. Free, you can go up and